everybody. Welcome to another episode of Friends Talking Nerdy. This is Tim Jowsman, and with me, I have the holiest of holies. I have the Reverend Tracy. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Tim. How about you? Doing good, doing good. Uh, we are here for another week on Patreon First. A month from now, this episode will be on our main podcast feed. We are here to talk more Big Mouth, and we both couldn't be more excited. <laughs> oh, yeah. I super looked forward to rewatching this episode. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this, um, and we're going to go into it, but you can tell we're both really, really excited, but um, before we start with the sh- uh, with, with our thoughts on the show first, um, being that we are focusing on Big Mouth for, um, for a while, we wanted to bring up the fact that Nick Kroll is a father now! Yay, so, Nick! Yeah, congrats to him on that. Uh, his wife um, posted some pictures on Instagram, I guess, of uh, their baby, I guess didn't recall um them naming a sex or anything like that but you know as long as it's healthy who cares you know so hopefully uh hopefully um you know he, he i'm sure he is very happy right now and um you know we wish we absolutely wish him the best yeah. but let's oh, go ahead i was gonna say see guys you can also just instagram like revealing that there's a baby and a child you don't have to blow up a cannon and accidentally kill anybody in your like life like for it yeah. that's like the latest one was a cannon going off i guess i saw that and you know how but it would be cool to be the one baby that already has like a, a, you know a kill on their record oh <laughs> <God>. <laughs> hashtag thug life <laughs> there you go um but yeah um first question we always ask general overview what did you think of this episode no spoilers no specific comments but did you like it <laughs> Oh, gosh, because, see, my overall does technically have a spoiler. Um, but I guess to not do any spoilers, um, no, I didn't like it. <laughs> I, I just didn't. I, I think there was just a lot a lot of stuff I didn't see the point of. But uh, I, I feel fairly confident in saying you can probably skip this episode and still generally get like the same amount of information elsewhere. Like I feel like we kind of have already had it insinuated enough that Nick star, like what that character is like, like I don't think it's a spoiler that Nick star is a douchebag. Um, so you kind of would have picked up like what they're sort of trying to project as Nick's future without this episode. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess watch it once, but if you're looking for an excuse to skip one, this would be it. What about you? Yeah, kind of in the same boat here because they really told nothing new. Um, I mean, we already yeah we already knew that Nick has had a problem with uh, you know p- pushing negative emotions out of his life, which meant kind of pushing people out of his life. And um, yeah, just the whole future se- sequence. Honestly, the show felt like filler more than anything. It it because yeah, you take this episode out of the rotation, you don't really miss anything. I mean, it's like that yeah. season of Dallas, uh, that old TV show from the eighties, Dallas. They had an entire season where things went nuts. They had characters die and whatnot. But then at the start of the season after that crazy thing, they revealed that the previous season was all a dream. And it's just yeah. like, why fuck with the audience like that? You know, and and. Yeah, so we'll get into specifics here, but um, like we do, we do try to, you know, look at the positives and negatives on everything. There is, there are positives in this episode, so start us off. What did you think was, uh, what were your positives for the Nick Star episode? So, I will throw it out there. I appreciated the change up with the intro. Um, I like the change in music. I like the feel of the intro since the episode was definitely out of their normal patterns, uh, that they changed it all the way from the beginning. So you knew not to expect a normal episode of Big Mouth, kind of like they did when it was about the parents and about Steve, how they kind of gave you a clue during the intro. Um, Mm -hmm. This one was way more obvious as to how far off it was going to be from our normal. I also really liked the raw commentary on reality TV made right at the go, Mm -hmm. introducing his show by saying it was, quote, where the poor and desperate humiliate themselves for a chance to receive basic human services. (laughs) This is something I've actually started feeling about reality shows and has actually put me off on watching many of them, Um, especially you go into like the brothers talking about their mother having cancer very close to some of the stuff you hear on other shows where money, big money prizes are involved. Um, 
uh, this would make our lives completely different is like what I remember hearing a lot, like from some of those shows, like in real world. Well, they had um, it was a game show not too long ago. I think it was on ABC where it, the, the contestants were students that had massive student debt and the winners had their student debt paid off. See, if that doesn't indicate that that's not a fucking problem, I don't know what. Anyway, don't want to digress on politics, folks. I'm going to keep <laughs> it to the to the big mouth topic here <laughs> but uh but no like alone i love alone i think alone is a really great show but there was like one episode that it really pulled at my heartstrings and it was you know they didn't have the best home life he talked often about how he grew up kind of broke and how it would mean the world and they would finally be out of this thing or finally be able to do insert thing and i was like man and that one like alone if you've never watched it it's pretty hardcore like they pull people for health reasons because some of them started to starve. Like, so there's, it actually got a little too close to being a little hunger game ish for me. Right. Um, so, uh, I mean, I still watch alone, but that was just an example of like, I wanted to give of like kind of those same thoughts, right? Like this is life changing. I have a hard life. This could make the difference. Um, so I kind of like, uh, when cartoons break down that barrier and make a kind of a moment to do a social commentary. So I dug that about this episode. Um, I also appreciated straight up saying you're too rich to die. Um, again, more social commentary and even talking about how health insurance isn't a thing anymore. Uh, there was a lot of little digs that I kind of appreciated a little bit. Yeah. Uh, let's see other little background touches that I appreciated. Cause there's a lot of little funny callbacks or other little commentaries. Uh, in the scene where Jesse's getting arrested, like he's looking at all the footage of Jesse when he's like looking her up to see what she's been up to. Uh, when she's getting arrested by the Amazon officer, because it's got Amazon written on his helmet. Yeah. And the picket signs in the back say, Alexa, stop killing. And boxes are made from people. <laughs> so I appreciated the jokes. Um, I really liked the guy that was running outside the car later. Uh, climate change is a hoax. Math is a lie. And then he bursts into flames. <laughs> uh, the billboard. I don't know if you caught it. There was an ad for cafeteria women. I saw that. Yeah. That okay. Was I, I, did, I did not catch that the first time I watched the episode because I was trying to look. And I was like, man, they actually kind of peppered in a lot of little like callbacks. So that's where I started kind of gaining some appreciation for this episode. Uh, while the making out part was, well, what it was, it was a good throwback for Nick's dad to look to Jay for affection. And if you catch that expression on Nick's face where it still bothered him, um, that was an interesting callback to when Jay lived with them. Uh, I think it was just the prior season. Um, yeah. Again, it goes into throwing that question as to why adults are ignoring a child who's obviously living in neglect. But, you know, that's another topic for another time. Uh, Judd being a cult leader and Caleb being very Caleb, like right in a row. I really appreciated the little uh, holograph of Judd. The end is nigh with his little raccoon army people and then Caleb being just extremely Caleb, like just to throw in that. Um, Nina, uh, Gina, sorry, uh, when he meets up with Gina and Andrew. Gina calling Nick just exactly how he was. Totally appreciated that. Um, where she says, it's been nice to look into your dead eyes and see nothing but profound loneliness. <laughs> I I like Gina's sass, and she's had it for a minute, so it was, it was kind of a good dig. Yeah. Um, let's see, the part was funny where Jesse, oh, the pills. Of, sorry, I just misread my note there for a second. Um, so you fast forward a little bit, you know, Nick has gotten hooked up with Jesse and has explained the pill situation. She's all game for it. Um, you know, at first she wasn't, though, and he, he goes to, like, hand her this pill and is trying to explain it has to be, like, rectally, like, mm -hmm. done. And I love that she had said she'd fallen for that before. <laughs> well, the, uh, yeah, I mean, I had no, a notation of that line. And I guess if you think about it, that is another good callback because she, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of darkness to that line if you think about it because she does have a history of essentially wanting to impress people, especially in romantic situations. And she, you know, like with uh, Michelangelo, um, who we did determine is in ninth grade, by the way. Yes. Yes. Um, but but uh, doing the vape stick with uh, Michelangelo. She didn't want to do that, but she wanted to impress him. So she did it. So that is another callback to um, her. Yeah, for how she gets. Um, and then the last little callback, 
because again, I just felt like they dumped a lot of jokes in this episode, and I'll I've got like a factoid at the end feeling where it's like I kind of see the purpose of it, but it did feel like a dope a joke dump episode. But I did really appreciate Missy's dad at the eulogy, still <laughs> talking about the bra the that was only used for beats. <laughs> So uh, that's all the callbacks. Um, The only last two notes I have for positivity. um, I did like the parallel between Jesse calling Nick out for his fake voice, which is the same thing Nick did when they'd met up with her and Michelangelo in the city, which they pointed out was the last time they'd spoken in this reality. Mm -hmm. Because like she kept punching him and saying, stop it, stop being a money zombie. And, you know, Nick, he's like, what is with that voice? You know, so I thought that was really interesting to throw immediately that parallel. Um, And then in the very end, we get the hormone monster, Rick, back in our lives. So we know that he's back. He is back. He's assigned to Nick again for whatever his awkward fucking puberty story is going to be (laughs) because he has Rick the hormone monster back. And those are the end of my positive notes. What about you? What about me? Um, yeah, uh, first thing I had, I did love, the, I think this is the first time they had the original changes from Black Sabbath uh, open the show. Um, you know, really great song. I remember uh, 99, my friend Chris and I went to the Palace of Auburn Hills in uh, Detroit, Michigan, to see the original Black Sabbath in concert. And he was really hoping that they would sing this song in concert. And Ultimately, they completed the show. They completed uh, their encore. The house lights go up, and that's when changes start. <laughs> you know, so they, it was technically played, but they didn't play it live. Um, so if Chris is listening, hey, how you doing? Um, I enjoyed the opening as well. Um, the laid back feeling at the start of the show, while the theme song is playing, and adult Nick is waking up to his day. Um, you know, I, I, for some reason I like that. Yeah, because to your point, it was a different way to kind of start the show. And just a different way to kind of, you know, because a, a lot of this, being that it ultimately is a dream sequence, is ludicrous, extreme. So it was nice starting off in some semblance of normality before yeah. we went into what they experienced. Um, I did enjoy the cafeteria women billboard um, Nick sees after he, has, he has escapes. Um, you know, I did, I did note that, sure, it's a, hey, I remember that thing moment. Um, but I like the show can find a way to give a callback to a previous episode without being super obvious about it. Uh, because that billboard wasn't like in your face, like shining. It was just like off in the background, kind of like what the Simpsons used to do back in the day when people had VCRs only. And it was one of those moments you had to freeze frame to catch it. Yeah, like I, I actually did kind of appreciate that about it. Because once you realized there were inside jokes going on, it actually made you appreciate it a little. Because then for me, it became a hunt for the inside jokes. Yeah. Uh, so that that is maybe the only redeemable factor of this episode. <laughs> One of them, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, this line here is, I love the line, we're all going now in my kill car. It's a Jetta. It's cute. That line from Lola. Um, I could just hear her talk all day. Um, she looks absolutely breathtaking. Love that line from Nick, and his delivery too was great. Um, when you know when he said it, he was seeing it almost like he was in like a serious melodrama or something, and and just the ridiculous line. Um, I did make a note about the radish bra. Um, Lola's line, yeah, I want to be the first chick to take a shit on the moon. <laughs> you know? Okay, I will confess that was like the Lola line that did get me with this one. <laughs> I want to yeah. be the first chick to take a shit on the moon. <laughs> Yeah, and last but not least, um, Rick is back. And, he, yeah, I mean, has there been instances in, in past episodes where they used him too much? Sure. So hopefully going forward they find the right balance. But not having him for a number of episodes, you could really feel it. You know, I, I, I welcome his presence, but in just the right amount. Yes, I'm hoping they learned with oversteving to not – overdo a character yeah um because i actually think they probably felt some of the feedback from that uh at least i hope so because it does seem like like they even took a break from steve there like for a little bit they didn't hit the ground hard with steve which is where i did appreciate you know we sure we got him at the pool at the beginning but for the most part it was more focused on camp Mm -hmm. so we didn't have to deal with him too much (laughs) 
I, and, th- and that's how it should be. I mean, because if like the Simpsons spent over 30 years only focusing on stories for the Simpsons family, that show would not have been on for 30 years. That show had to by by default, essentially, f- d- you know, dive into the lives of the minor characters. And that's how you find these extra stories like uh, South Park. The, another example, um, you know, Butters was just a background character. But once they gave a story to Butters and saw how he interacted with Cartman, they brought him in more and now he's essentially part of the gang. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. All right. We went through a very short positive list. What was the negative aspects of uh, this episode for you? For me overall, I just think the storyline was fucking terrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> the cum diaper and the snortable orgasm stuff just felt like they were looking for excuses to be excessively gross. Yeah. Um, like, and I get it. Like, Big Mouth does touch on some kind of gross topics, but uh, this one I just felt kind of edged on that just being unnecessary. Um, it kind of like the moment where they swaddled the the giant shit in his shirt. Like, why, why, why? <laughs> right, right. Uh, his relationship with A three. I just don't super. I and. They've talked about it before, uh, although I will mention that I thought it was funny that and the A3 reminded him, like, just that, you know, if you do, if you chose to, there is a switch where we will be gay together or whatever it is that he said. <laughs> that part was kind of chuckle worthy. But other than that, just the, the, the robot Andrew is just kind of weird and sad. Mm. Uh, the toilet people. Why was that necessary? Like, all it was was kind of a weird joke they made every now and then, and it felt kind of forced in there. Like, you could have taken the toilet people out of it, and it would have been a totally different, like, it, it would have still made sense. Like, Jessie could have been, like, fighting, because, you know, she's you know, kind of a, a protester type, and she's, you know, toilet people are people too. But she could have easily been protesting about the fact that, I don't know, the Earth was obviously dying. There were situations going on but Mm. that's what the focus was on was toilet people which doesn't seem like it would actually make sense for jesse but well think uh, about it and think about how um it is in today's society i mean we got a lot of serious stuff going on but a lot of times it's the most superfluous stuff that's that's getting the attention like i remember um it was like an nbc msnbc one time they were it was like andrea mitchell show and they were like discussing a policy matter and all of a sudden we got breaking news. Justin Bieber has broken up with his girlfriend. No. <laughs> yeah, basically. It is, a, it is so, a problem in our society that we do tend to ignore the serious problems for for other problems that may that are very that that can be very much legitimate, but you but distract you from taking care of the more serious problems first. I should say. Yeah, I mean, I guess I just questioned why there needed to be toilet people at all. There was no. Uh, there's no. Yeah. Fi- yeah, I mean, they, they, was, they were there for one very brief minor moment when Jay's dad was on the toilet, and you saw, like, one minor hand reaching for his pubic hair, and he lectured them. That was it. That's the only time you saw them. Otherwise, they were just spoken of. Yeah, I feel like it was like they just had, like, a character idea that they knew they couldn't actually put into the show at any point, so they just wanted to make jokes about it in this episode. It was just, I, I didn't get their existence. I don't understand yeah. why we made up toilet people. Uh but, yeah, I mean, not that it's like, oh, my God, like, I hated it because of that. It was just another point of, like, but why? Um, which that's really, I guess that's the big beef with the episode is there were more but whys than there mm-hmm. were laughing moments. So uh, why is the pillow suppository? See, my next question is straight a why. At this point, the episode just felt like an excuse to be unnecessarily gross, like, especially once it got to that point, because the that was, he had already, like, splayed open with the cum diaper thing and being changed by A3. Like, yeah, at that point, I was a little over it. Yeah. Um, marrying a bottle, dumb puns about Jesse's boobs, and then ultimately calling her the loud redhead with tits. Uh, I know you had kind of appreciated some of the boob jokes, but since that one came so much later and I was just kind of over it at that point, um, I was just kind of over the boob jokes from him. There was just a lot. And that was just the thing. It was it was more uh, commenting on the positivity of the delivery and not necessarily, you know, it's the greatest moment in, you know, television. It, it was like uh, I, I tried to look for some positives and I thought it was. <laughs> yeah. I get you. Um, yeah, I just I couldn't not that one. I was just over him being that way. Yeah. Uh, they even managed to dro- throw Lo J in there for me being them. 
Um, no, they yeah. did have some really funny moments though, and I kind of liked that like they were totally ripped like post-apocalyptic cannibals, <laughs> and that I thought it was just kind of interesting that they were in some like sex cult with Nick's parents, but in a weird way, I guess that kind of makes sense because I don't know they decided it did. It it felt weird and awkward, but eh. Um, Gina, you look like a mom. She had marvelous breasts when we were children. Ugh, we get it. Nick Starr is a douche. Like, yeah. again, it was just getting, I was just getting overkill of this human just being a massive douche. And I guess if that was their point was to really drive it home that this person may be a piece of shit, they did a great job about that. Um, but it just was over it. Um, the situation with Jesse in the hall where the whole things could have been different conversation. It felt very forced and it made no sense to me, especially as it spun up like a romance movie. It's always been you. And then she replies like, all jokingly, oh my God, it has always been you. And then they share their kiss. Um, I did appreciate the little side note that that was the same hall that they had kissed 30 years prior. Thought that was kind of cool. Um, but then beyond that, Jesse's motives just got more confusing from there. You know, she yeah. helps Nick escape. Um, and then the whole Cantor Dina was probably the only callback I really didn't appreciate. <laughs> it, it, the, at that point, there was a lot of stuff that just felt really forced. Because um, yeah. like I said, I think really other than Rick... Uh, coming back at this point of the episode, it was all just downhill for me. Um, uh, going, let's see, the end going from character to character, character doing whatever they're doing, like totally unrealistic responses to, like that they're actually going to be like having sex or masturbating, like while the world's falling apart. Like I don't know, I don't think that's actually a super likely thing that most people would do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, you know. Yeah, we got an asteroid coming, but let's see what's on Pornhub right now. Hmm. Yeah, There's it's kind of like there was a lot of jokes with the pandemic about staying in. Oh, my God, we're going to have a baby boom. So I actually remembered reading an article like from a psychologist saying, actually, no, like people tend to not have babies. Like when when things are not like be going at it, like in that sense, like when things like that are going on. So I just it just seems silly to me and unnecessary. But, you know, it's them. They talk a lot about masturbation. So I guess they just wanted to throw it in there. The yeah. idea that everybody would just want to fucking masturbate while the earth is like falling apart. <laughs> so and then in the end, Jesse just decides to like end humanity. Like she just had this bomb fest, like ready to go, like with her at the funeral, by the way, which, by the way, like, what was her plan to have that with her at the funeral? Because they went straight from that. Like, did she just keep one in case the opportunity presents itself? Yeah, they didn't give any sort of indication that she was aware that Nick had this invitation. You know, right. I mean, if they had if they had some scene, some minor scene or even like Missy told me you would be told, you know, yeah, something to explain that she would have a reason to kind of manipulate it to get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, ends humanity, and then like some of the last lines is like, maybe if you'd fucked me right, you might have all lived. And then <laughs> saying, you won't tell your friends, will you? Like, wait a second, they're about to all die. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then for some reason, her final battle cry was, for the toilet people! <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, and then... The episode wraps, we get the mosquitoes, or basically he just had like this big little anxiety black hole thing. And I guess that's where I kind of came out with it in the end. It's like, this was either the worst episode of Big Mouth I've seen so far, or the best depiction of just how dumb an anxiety attack rabbit hole can be. Well, I, and, I, and I get that, but, you know, the viewer still has to have some some sense of logic to latch on to and i think that's you know and i'll get into it a little more when i uh, talk about my negatives i guess but just a, there was a lot of internal logic that was just not there not being followed and you know i i get that you know a lot of people may have the argument of well this was a dream sequence but it's not a real dream they're telling a story even if it's a dream sequence they still have you know storytelling rules that they should follow by that they kind of yeah. didn't in this episode and I think that's why I feel conflicted by it, because like I said, it's either the wor like my least favorite episode to date, or they totally broke all those rules on purpose, because how logical is an anxiety attack rabbit hole? 
I get that. And, you know, as someone who's had his fair share of them, I, you know, I, I, I understand that, but, in, yeah. but again, we're talking about a TV show here right. and they still have to have some sense of internal logic, like a James Bond movie, um, like the early ones with like Roger Moore are silly, but they still have an internal logic that they go by, which, uh, which has to, which has to be there. There has to be logical reasons for things happening, you know? So, um, but, but are you done with uh, your negatives? Uh, yeah, that was that was it. I actually tried not to make a huge list of everything. Uh, I tried to just kind of, I didn't want to be like on the negative horse for too long. But uh, what did you have? What did I have? I started off the, I started off with this cum diaper. Seriously, the amount of cum he would need to realistically fill up that diaper in the episode would be many days worth just sitting in it. Ew. Nope. I didn't need that image at all. You know, it's like the, the I, I can see at some point in the future some guy making a chemical that would, you know, elicit an orgasm without the help of anybody. I could see that could be more realistic because, you know, a guy somewhere is tr trying to work on making it. But the cum diaper thing, just like that was uh, th that was just there to make give you a reaction of you just yeah. um, the game they play on the game show. Fuck your brother. They didn't need to do that. I mean, it, I mean, to your point, they are. It was, um, it was a, a, a play on, you know, entertainment today and how it is very exploitative of poor people and people in situations, um, you know. And it does surprise me that they don't have a show like What Would You Do for Money, something like, you know, something like. Well, the technical. Well, I mean, group. we do. We have like hundreds of them. Is kind of. <laughs> Well, the, the one example I told you about, the, you know, students on that game show trying to, you know, win money to pay off their student debts. I mean, we do have people dancing so they can, you know, get into some semblance of normal life. And that's just I, I get the point they were trying to make. I think they didn't have to go that severe. You know, but I, I, I guess for this one, I guess I, I, I can tr also admittedly chalk this up to this didn't work for me. So, um, I don't get the toilet people they threw up, used throughout the episode. There was just no point. Um, there's no future reference of them anyway. Um, maybe this could be a situation to where next season or the season after that, maybe they do introduce him and then we can look back and then kind of see, oh, and get, get a better appreciation for like, that. Like, maybe there'll be a baby at some point, and this will be the thing that's like, maybe this is why kids are afraid of the toilet. I don't know. That's 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 reaching, though. Um, yeah, uh, maybe they'll come in handy. I just, it felt forced. <laughs> it did. It did. Um, another thing, the adult Nick character is just a character I do not like. Yes, he's what Nick could be in the future. Um, just when you have a character that is so irredeemably shitty like Nick, you, you can't really relate to it you know like like take ebenezer scrooge in a christmas carol christmas carol you know throughout that story for the at the beginning you know first two-thirds of that story he was very much an evil asshole but he still had traits that you know we as the reader um could 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 relate to and then yeah. you know ebenezer made that change we were able to feel happy for them there were no redeeming qualities about nick star in this episode Right, like you can be a likable character, like you could be despicable and likable. Darn You could be a little bad and likable. Well, actually, a really good example is George Costanza. Um, oh. Yeah, in Seinfeld, was he's like not really that likable of a human, but he does just enough. Like it's not crossing a boundary, so you still get entertainment out of him without kind of being worn out. Like, and there's a fine line to that. And I think you just helped me realize that's why I don't like the Nick Starr-ness of this episode. Like, they kind of beat it to death, like, where it made me not even really appreciate him as a character in the show. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next one, the Martin Scarelli jokes just didn't land for me. Um, Martin Scarelli is 
a scumbag of a human being um, in in many many ways, and and I get that they were essentially making another knock at our society today, to where we do hold in reverence people that are absolute vermin nine times out of ten, um, who could like you know who Scarelli is, right? I actually don't, so I was going to let you let me know about it. <laughs> he was kind of like one of those investment people that bought um, a health insurance company and then raised the price of a particular life-saving drug like 5,000 percent oh okay I think I probably heard about this though okay yeah, he's, he's got the type of face that you would just love to like kick in <laughs> wait EpiPen wasn't it the EpiPen it might have been him yeah I, I think I do know who you're talking about then okay like I just didn't recognize the name at first but yeah either it's either him or it's somebody who did the same yeah, I, behavior, so. yeah, and I can send you the picture, uh, his picture later, but yeah, just a douchebag, and, you know, I, yeah, it just, it didn't land for me, I didn't like those jokes. Um, so the next note, so what's the next course of business after you're told the Earth is going to be destroyed? Talk about movie parts, of course. How did that make sense with, with Nick having the discussion with his his uh, his agent about taking on the remake of Toy Story after he's told that the Earth is going to be destroyed within a day. Well, uh, keep in mind, he's going on this base or whatever where all the rich people are, so they might still make movies there. And, I, and true, maybe that is the logic that they had, but even the it most selfish of human beings is going to be worrying about self-preservation above anything else. You know, yeah. I mean, a, a truly selfish person like that, the first thing they would do is get off the phone, find that plus one, whoever they could find, and immediately get there. Um, not talk about a movie role. And that just didn't feel, it didn't feel logical. It just didn't make any sort of sense. And that was one thing that really early on was one thing that kind of helped pull me out of this episode, you know, so... See, um, for me, I took that that nonchalant am, uh, kind of attitude that wealthy people can have. It's like, well, I've got money, so that will get me out of this. Like, I, I think we're more familiar to it in the legal sense. Um, mm. But then, you know, every now and then you get a wealthy person that gets like a really particularly aggressive cancer, and then it turns out the money doesn't get them out of that. So I could kind of see that maybe they were going for that level, like hyperboleing it some. Like, this is how much they really think they're secure in being fine is that they think they can do this. But I, I'm dead with you. I don't think that's very realistic. Yeah. And since my brain, when we watched this, I didn't know it was a dream. It made it kind of not land with me either. Like, yeah, <laughs> it felt weird. Yeah, it, it, it was. Um, all right, my next note. If Nick is as selfish as they say when he is an adult, why would adult Andrew still attempt to be friendly with him like he is in this episode? You know, I mean, multiple times they I mean, like at the beginning, they had Andrew calling and, you know, oh, I'm surprised you pick up, picked up. I, you know, if, if someone did that to me over, you know, 30 years time, I think I would eventually get the point at some point that they don't really want to talk to me. Um, and, and, you know, I, 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 yeah. And if somebody, too, is is that hardcore like Nick in terms of keeping people pushed away emotionally, um yeah, I you know, maybe maybe it's because Andrew is a nice guy and maybe he still thinks yeah I'm still gonna reach out maybe maybe I am overthinking this just a little bit I just don't see Andrew having that I don't see it being logical for a person to have that that much care for a person that there's that that routinely shows them that he doesn't want to be close to them. Yeah, well, I mean, is it care or is it insecurity? Because they've done a really good job about kind of displaying how insecure Andrew is. Like, mm. even I think we took the spline differently in Cafeteria Girls whenever he said, you know, oh, anything, I'll take anything, right? Um, I thought that was more of he just devalues himself so much that he will take whatever is on the table. And right. so that's kind of his cling, right? He even mentioned it like, oh, I tell people that I know you all the time. So I actually could see that in the sense of I guess there are some people who have that level of insecurity that they really cling to things like that and really do hope that that person will see value in them. It's, you know, almost an abusive relationship between those two anyway. Like, look yeah. at how he even treats the robot version of Andrew, which is why I guess another note for the just non-appreciation of that relationship is that 
he gets a robotic version of a human being who does everything the way he wants it to. And I, that's just so representative of, of so much awful mindset that, uh, yeah. And it almost makes it even sadder that Andrew is like basically thirsty for him. Right. Right. Um, all about him is because, you know, he probably knows about that robot version. So, I mean, yeah, that's, uh, I think it's playing to his desperation there. And also, because we do now know that this is a dream, I think it goes to show what Nick thinks of Andrew in that sense. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I didn't consider it that way. And I, I you know, thinking of it that way, I, I guess I can see it, but it still has to land. And it, and it did not land with me. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, this is why we have these fun conversations and nerd out about it. We make each other think about things in different ways. And Very especially different. with the topics they cover, it's almost worth talking about. Because, again, I'm a bit of a psychology nerd, and I love how much they are kind of digging into some of these issues. Agreed, agreed. Um, all right, my next note. I didn't need to know that loge are necrophiliacs i could have lived without that information i didn't need to know that nick's parents were also necrophiliacs i mean you know at the end of the world if they all wanted to live in a house and fuck each other i mean whatever like you know life's too short enjoy it if everything is consensual great but just would things devolve that quickly that fast that it becomes okay for them to become necrophiliacs just yeah, I think there was just another one of those gross factors that they thought, let's just be yeah. gross and see it. Because, yeah, like, I, I forgot the, the line that she had, but it was like Lola made a line about, you know, not, you know, like. Uh, I gotcha. It's, her, it's. Of, eating them or yeah we we what was it we fuck them we eat them and not necessarily in that order <laughs> like, yeah yeah, yeah. And it's again it, it felt like they were just going for gross a lot and it was just too much in too many little areas because why did they need to be cannibals at all because why did we need to be necrophiliacs like why was any of that necessary it, it it wasn't and um but again to be clear that is just something that didn't land with me i don't think it's something that necessarily is like a flaw per se with the story but you know so just take that take that for what you will um putting gina and andrew together in the future did seem random you know yeah like that didn't make sense to me at all personally so yeah, like like th is there a chance that this means that you know like in future seasons we could see them get together and if that's the case great but um the, you know for the most part any sort of interaction they've had i mean gina is already is kind of given the impression that she doesn't think he's a bad guy necessarily but weird you know yeah. and I, I i just don't get uh, and, and things change people change people's op opinions change and whatnot but this just, this just felt like we got nothing to do with them so let's put them together type of deal and and i guess they had to go that route uh with missy being dead you know um so there is that but uh last but not least i you know i you know, for as much as it was indicative of Jesse's character, the whole pill in the butt thing, you know, um, I, I don't think people should be comfortable with I, I, I just wasn't comfortable with laughing at that type of character flaw in somebody because that shouldn't be done for a laugh. And if it is done for a laugh, it should be in a way to point out that, you know, you shouldn't, you know, try to change yourself for other people and do things you don't want to do just because you think you're going to impress, I guess. So I, again, this is a, that's another nitpick note than anything. It just didn't sit right with me just because if anything, I felt bad for Jesse, you know, <laughs> the fact that yeah. she's just like, Oh, come on, give, give her a hug type of deal. But, you know. <laughs> Poor Jesse. We know how much she's been going through. So, yeah, yeah. So, wrap it up. Um, we, I, I think we both have made it pretty clear we didn't like this episode. But now that we've gone through the, 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 the specific pros and cons, why do you not care for this episode? <sighs> like I said, it just. 
I think it could have been done differently and been better, even if they were trying to go for a really good depiction of how anxiety attacks can just take you down like this really dumb black hole sometimes. Um, I think there's some things they could have done differently. Uh, they could have ramped up a lot of the nonsense for the end, which I felt like they did, but because there was so much nonsense throughout it, it just made it feel like kind of forced and put together and a dumping ground for like the jokes that they didn't know how to fit in in other places. But I guess I, I still maintain that you can probably skip this episode and not really miss too much of actual character development. Um, yeah, uh, unless you want to reframe it and kind of take it as a depiction of how dumb an anxiety attack can be. I just, it wasn't my favorite. And yeah, maybe maybe a little bit less jokes. I would have found more value in it. And that's right. Like, that's the other thing is once you've kind of hit that point where like you've already had like, oh my God, I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this. It's so much easier to see like other little nitpicky, quote unquote, nitpicky things mm -hmm. to not like because your brain's already there. So in essence, I think there is just, too much that put me off of it right at the go and this episode didn't have a chance for me yeah kind of in the same boat here uh the the note i had is that this is an episode that can and uh, what did i say invited wow i don't okay this <laughs> <my, laughs> what did you do I, I don't know. I fucked up something in my notes, but oh, long story short, this is one that can be missed. There is really nothing new that is brought to the table in this episode. We already know that uh, Nick still has feelings for Jesse. We already know that Nick um, has a tendency to emotionally push people away. And we, you know, as human beings, obviously, and the fact that we've already been introduced to the Nick star character before are aware that the more you consistently you do this, the more, you know, you can, you know, put up barriers and be a dick like like nick ultimately has but the fact that you know nick the nick star character has no redeeming qualities whatsoever just made this really tough to get through and a lot of the choices that they make for story beats just didn't make sense like if you watched every episode in season four except for this one you miss nothing whatsoever because I, if I'm not mistaken, like the very start of the next episode, they do a brief, they, they do a brief recap of this episode. Anyway, I think they mentioned that, that he had a dream or something. And I, I and Nick star comes back anyway at the, at the, at the end of the season. So yeah, this, this, this wasn't needed. I guess I, maybe their argument is that they needed this to establish just how much of an antagonist he is yeah. for how they uh, eventually go at him. But yeah, if you're going to, this is one I can confidently say, if you avoid it, you're not missing anything because if anything, this really would feel like a filler. You know. Yeah, if you get to the cum diaper scene at the very beginning and you're just like, do I have, like, if it's as off-putting to you <laughs> as it was to me, yeah. you can go ahead and turn it off. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I I don't want to give up spoilers for later episodes, so it's possible when we get to that final episode, like you mentioned, I might bring this one up again. Um, mm. Because that's really the only other purpose I could see, is just trying to remind you of who this character is. So... Well, with that, we will wrap up this week's episode. We uh, thank you for uh, getting uh, joining us again for another discussion. Um, oh, and I, I should say that too. Yeah, um, yeah, and and that's the beauty of the show, though, and that's the beauty of uh, television in particular. Um, not every show will always be a one hundred percent. This is a greatest show ever type of of show. So there needs to be peaks and valleys, and this was very much a valley. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, anyway, um, we will. Uh, th we thank you all for listening. Uh, check us out on our regular podcast feed. Uh, support us on Patreon. Follow us on our social media platforms: Facebook, um, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. Uh, anything else you want to bring up? Um. No. No, not really. Have a great month, everybody. If you're in Portland, uh, good luck with however this snowmageddon pans out for you and yours. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you're listening to us a month from now on our regular podcast feed, enjoy that warm weather while it's there. <laughs> so, all right. Whatever it's doing in March. Exactly. So with that, we will see you all next week. Bye. Subscribe to Friends Talking Nerdy on iTunes, the Google Play Music Store, as well as Spotify. Remember to support Friends Talking Nerdy on Patreon.
Goodbye, darling.